Hello! This video will be our first one on data structure design, and today we're talking about the extensible array. So let me start with a motivating example. We're going to go back to the class we saw earlier to compute a mean from some series of input values. And in this case, we want to read those values from a file. So I'm going to use the in object provided by the algs4 library, which is provides a convenient way to read values from a file. And we have data.txt here. Now, did I make data.txt? Yes, yes I did. Do I remember how many values I put in it? Let's say that I do not. This file has one number per line, but there could be a lot of lines. So how might we go about writing this mean class to actually compute the mean of the, the values in that file? Well, first attempt might be something like, uh, what if I had uh, a separate variable for each value in the file? So I do input read int, and if I knew that there were four values, or I only cared about the first four values uh, uh, in the file, could read them in one at a time, assign them to their own variable, and then print out uh, the mean is and then add them all up. And divide by four, since I know they're exactly four. Uh, forgot the plus. All right. Uh, this is obviously not going to work in any scalable way. That means as the number of values we're working with grows, uh, having a variable for each is, is just not going to work. So. Uh, and we also need to know exactly how many values there are, right? This program would not work uh, if there were only three values in the file. This fourth one would, uh, th this fourth attempt to read an integer would cause an error. So uh, maybe I can har uh, have an array of, of values. Um, that's certainly better than having one variable for each. And I'll make a variable n that is the number of values that I have and create a new array of that size. Uh, and I'm going to need a, uh, a variable to keep track of how many values I've read. And then uh, I will get rid of those individual variables and use a for loop. Um, where I have int i and while i is less than n, and it's the case that there uh, is a next line of my input, I don't want to keep going around this loop uh, if there's no uh, input remaining, and I'll just in turn read each integer and assign it to um, a uh, element of the array. Why do I need this variable to keep track of the number of values I've read? Because what if I, I know there are 10 slots in my array, but if I only read five values, I don't want to divide by the length of the array when computing the mean. That would include a bunch of, a bunch of zeros uh, in the unused parts of the array. So I need to keep track of how many numbers I'm actually dealing with. Then I just want to compute uh, the sum of these values. Uh, I'll use this, uh, another uh, snippet from uh, VS Code, but in this case, I just want to iterate uh, over the values in the array to get the sum. We'll divide the sum by the number of values read, and we get the mean, but we have not solved the problem of actually computing the mean of all the values in that file, right? I've said uh, I've committed to a fixed capacity of 10 uh, of these integers, and what if there are more than 10 integers in this file? Well, right, before I go any further, let's make sure that this mean, current mean implementation actually works. Uh, I run it, it prints out a mean of uh, 54.2 of the first 10 values, that's all well and good. Um, but what if there are more than 10 values? What if I just made the array huge instead, like 10 
uh, like a billion or 10 billion uh, entries. So if I run this uh, with this huge array, I actually get exception in the thread main, java.lang.out of memory error. I literally ran the Java out of memory uh, with trying to create an array of 10, uh, 10 billion integers. So what if I uh, shrunk it down to merely uh, a billion, or maybe that's 100 million. Yeah, it looks like 100 million. Uh, so that actually, we have our array of 100 million. Uh, it, it reads through the whole file. I'm pretty sure there are not uh, 100 million lines in data.txt, and it computes the mean. The problem with this approach of just using a giant array is that we're wasting a whole bunch of memory. We're wasting, uh, if there's a thousand integers in our data file, our mean program is uh, wasting the space for uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, 900 uh, and 99,000 integers. Uh, that's not a, not a good practice uh, when, when we're writing software. We really like some way to store a sequence of integers that doesn't just waste a huge amount of space. We have the number of integers specified as part of our program here, just this constant, 100 million. Uh, we could take it as input from the user, but that doesn't actually solve this problem because then instead of us pre-committing to uh, uh, a particular amount of integers, we're asking the user to do this instead. I really want some way to have an array of flexible size. Like that's the, the real crux of this is that with the uh, kind of basic array that we have in Java, it's a fixed size. And so if we want it to be, uh, that makes it very difficult to have it make it large enough for the amount of data we have without wasting a bunch of space if we don't know ahead of time exactly how much data uh, it's, going to, it's going to take. And so the solution to this is going to be uh, an extensible array, an array that can uh, grow as needed. And this will be a, an object that provides the abstraction of an array that can hold as many elements as needed. So we're going to have an object that, from the user's pr perspective, behaves just like an array, but one that can accommodate as many elements as it needs to, uh, and that is not fixed size. And the neat thing is that we're actually going to implement this extensible array uh, using a fixed size array underneath. So let's uh, get into that. And we're going to uh, start with an object called uh, an array int list. Uh, it's going to be uh, an array that uh, has uh, uh, the ability to uh, get items at a particular index, to set uh, ints at a particular index, to, but also to add uh, integers to either the end of the array or to a specific point in the array. We're also going to be able to remove elements as well as being able to ask our array int list object whether it's empty and how many current elements are in the array. And one thing I want to point out about the documentation here is that each of these uh, methods has a comment about a pre or or post condition. That's what this pre and post means here. And this is a common way to document code uh, in that they specify the preconditions, what must be true when this method is called, like what this method will assume is true, and post conditions, which is what is guaranteed to be true when the method returns, like what is the effect of this method. So we can see in this get method here, the precondition is that the index that's provided here is between is uh, greater than or equal to zero and less than the size. So it's a valid index to our array. And the post condition is that this method will return the elements stored in that location. So uh, 
before we get into the implementation of uh, the array and list, I want to show you how would this actually be used in our mean class to, uh, to, to solve this problem we were having. And so the, the main idea is that instead of having this uh, fixed size array for data, we're going to have an array int list for our data and we'll make it, uh, we'll just create a new array int list. We won't need our values uh, read anymore. And uh, we'll just say uh, while our uh, input has another line to read, uh, we're going to add that int to our array int list. And then uh, we'll sum up the array, uh, we'll sum up all the values in our array int list, and instead of using the square brackets to index into our extensible array, we'll use the get method. Uh, and you can see that, that this array int list kind of simplifies uh, this code and gets rid of the kind of uh, constants we were hard coding in there. And it really does what we, uh, what we want, which is give us the abstraction of an array that can just hold as many, as many elements as we need. All right, but how is it going to actually do this? Um, its secret, as I said, is that it's actually using a fixed size array underneath, and it's just providing the illusion, or uh, uh, the kind of fancier term is abstraction, of being an array uh, of flexible size. Uh, so let's start out uh, with uh, what fields will we have. Uh, we're going to have, uh, and we'll make our fields private, we're going to have an int array that's our element data, and we're going to have our uh, we're also going to keep track of the count, of the, the number of elements that are in our array. And our constructor will just arbitrarily pick that our element data is always going to start out uh, with space for 10 elements. And of course our count will start out at zero. We start out, we're initializing an empty, uh, empty array. Our get method very uh, straightforward. We're simply going to return the element at this uh, at this index, and um, that will be that. Set uh, is uh, very similar. That our element data uh, at the index is going to be set uh, to this new element. The one wrinkle is that. Uh, this set method actually returns the old value at that index. This is uh, something that many uh, data structures do. It can be useful that, uh, to, to get back the old value uh, when setting a new one. Of course, the user doesn't have to use this, but in case they need it, it's nice to return. So what I'll actually do is store the current value at that index in a temporary variable then reassign it, and then return uh, my temporary variable, uh, which is the old value. So, like an array, these get and set methods are providing uh, the ability to read and write uh, at any index, and this is uh, often called random access. Uh, meaning that we can access the elements of our array and list in any order. And um, a property of the built-in arrays in Java is that accessing uh, elements anywhere within the array is very efficient. And to make this more uh, concrete, uh, when we talk about efficiency in terms of time, like how much time is it going to take the computer to uh, uh, access an element in an array, for example. We think about this by counting the number of operations that the computer will need to do, kind of the amount of work it will take uh, in order to perform an operation. And so uh, 
something that we will do uh, again and again when analyzing the performance of a data structure, how much work is the computer going to need to do to say perform this get operation. Uh, a question that we will always ask is does the number of operations involved in this get method depend on the amount of data that we were working with? That is, does this get method take more work to execute as there are more, as this element data array gets bigger, or as this index gets bigger, or as some other property of our data structure grows? And in this case, the answer is no. No matter what the index is, no matter what the size of element data is, it's a single step to go access the element at a particular index in an array. And this is uh, something that we call constant time, meaning that the amount of time, the amount of work this is going to take is constant with respect to the size of the data. That uh, kind of even as the data gets very large, it's the same amount of work to do this. And this is kind of the most uh, efficient that we can be under this kind of analysis. And so we really like our operations to be constant time. And uh, we can look at this set the same way. It has a few more kind of steps involved. We save the current element, we update, and then we return. But nonetheless, we do these same three steps regardless of how much data is involved. So this will also be constant time. Neither of these depend on the size of the input. And that's, that's good because the built-in array has this property of constant time uh, access. And so it's nice that our array int list will be able to provide that as well. That makes it a good, re uh, uh, a good replacement, at least in that respect, uh, for our array. So, now we get to uh, perhaps the more, the more interesting part, uh, which is uh, adding and removing uh, elements from, from our array. So for adding uh, this, we're going to uh, add to the end of the array. And you see possibly extended. So right, what if we already have 10 elements in our array and we want to add uh, an 11th. So I'm actually going to make a call to uh, a method ensure capacity and I want to ensure that there's at least element count. Remember that's how many things are, are currently stored in our array list. I want to ensure that, that there's at least element count plus one uh, uh, spots in our internal array uh, so that once we uh, ensure that, I can say that element data at element count oops, equals our element, uh, and then element count plus plus. So thinking through the logic of this, element count starts at zero, and that's actually the first index where we're going to want to put uh, something in our array int list. So we would store something there and then add one to element count. So it's now there's one element in our array and also index one is the first empty index. So we can actually use this element count both as the, the kind of the index at the end of the elements currently in our array and list and also the number of elements currently in there. So that's nice. Um, but you may notice that there is uh, no ensure capacity uh, method in here. And that's because I, I started out by only putting in the public methods uh, that this class will have. And ensure capacity is not a public method. It's not something that, say, our mean class using the array int list would ever call. It's a private helper method. It's a method that uh, the public methods in this class will use uh, in order to help them uh, 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 help them perform this. And uh, because I'm going to be using this ensure capacity in more than one place, it's nice to have it be its kind of own private helper method. So 
I will use this quick fix to create this um, private unsure capacity, which it inconveniently put it where my other add method will go. So I'm actually going to put it here uh, at the end. And so this is a, a, a private method. Remember, that means that it won't be um, uh, available to any, anywhere outside this class definition, but we can call it in these other methods. So let's look at this uh, add method where we can insert um, anywhere uh, at a particular index in our array. We will again ensure capacity of uh, element count uh, plus one. Also, I'm going to rename my uh, ensure capacity to target size. Um, and uh, there's, when we're adding an element in an array, if we have uh, an array where we have uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, and uh, we call uh, add at index 2, uh, 5, uh, what we want is the result where we have 3, 6, and then we inserted the value 5 at index 2, uh, and then 9, 12. Uh, but if all we do is um, the same as, as this other add method, uh, where we say element data at uh, index equals element, what that uh, would give instead is that we would replace the uh, element at index 2, and uh, we would not actually be inserting a, a, a new element. It wouldn't be growing the array like we want to. And so uh, in order to get what we want here, we're actually going to need to shift over um, uh, all the, the elements uh, that to the right of where we want to insert. So our first step is going to be uh, three, six. We need to put, we need to kind of open up a space here uh, so that then we can uh, insert our new, uh, our new element to get three, six, five, nine, twelve. So how this is going to work is we're going to use a for loop to shift all the elements to the right of the place we're inserting. We're shifting them over uh, in, order, in order to make room. And um, we need to uh, uh, cop we need to be careful about the order in which we do this shifting over. Um, that that you might think, well, uh, we're starting here, we'll shift this one over to here, and then this one over to here. Uh, but if we, if we did that, and there's uh, a figure uh, in the notes that you, may, that, that you may find useful to look at, uh, if we shift uh, left to right, we copy 9 to here, and now we've lost 12. And so we'd end up copying 9 uh, over again. And so we actually need to start at the at the, the right hand side, shift that over, and then kind of shift each of them over uh, like that. And the way that this is going to look in code is that we'll have uh, our our loop variable i. It's going to start at the end of our of our array at the far end, and we're going to go from there down to the index where we're inserting, and I, we're going to be subtracting one from our loop variable each time. And minus minus is kind of the inverse of plus plus, and that it will subtract one from our variable i inside this loop. We're just going to be shifting over the element data at index uh, i minus one to i. So shifting over our data 
one spot to the right each time we go around this loop. And so once we're done with this loop, we're in this situation where we've where the index where we're inserting uh, it would still have nine at this point, uh, but we've shifted this uh, nine and twelve kind of one spot over so that this we can now fill in with our uh, the new element that we're inserting, and we need to remember to increment the element count since we've now added a new a new element to our to our array. So remove is going to be uh, pretty similar. We're first going to uh, uh, store the element being removed because that gets that gets returned. Uh, so we can actually just use our uh, get method uh, to to do that. And typically, um, when we can use uh, other other methods. Um, as, as part of a method implementation that can be helpful uh, in kind of reducing uh, the amount of code that we have to write. Our element count uh, is decreasing, and so kind of at this point, element count is decreased. So where we consider the end of our list has moved, but our, nothing has changed about the data in the elements, and we're again going to need to shift elements over uh, in order uh, to uh, in order to kind of shift them over to fill in the element that was just removed. So I will say while um, and I will just use this uh, where uh, uh, variable to keep track that we're going to be um, uh, Starting at the place that got removed, we're going to take the element to the right and just replace it with the element at our at index where. So element data where equals element data where plus one. So uh, in our add, we were shifting thing, we were taking our elements and and shifting them kind of one spot uh, to the right to make room for the new element. Our remove method does the opposite. We're shifting all elements kind of above the, the point at which we were moved to the left to fill in to fill in the remove spot where plus plus and return the result. Uh, the result being the element that was removed. All right, so just like we took a moment to consider what is the performance of our uh, uh, get and set, and realize that those were constant time operations. Add and remove uh, partially depends on this ensure capacity, uh, but just uh, putting that aside for the moment, uh, we can see that, that this add uh, method, like our get and set, adding to the end that's the same number of steps, kind of no matter uh, how much uh, data, data is in the list. So um, constant time, but I'll put a question mark here because uh, if ensure capacity uh, is not constant time, uh, then that would obviously affect what add takes as a whole. But these add and remove with loops are a little more interesting because anytime you see a loop, that opens up the possibility that the performance of that code is slower than constant time because uh, a loop could theoretically be be infinite, right? If you have an infinite loop, uh, the time that that method will take will indeed uh, be infinite, it will never finish. And so when we have a loop, we need to think more carefully, uh, we need to think carefully about how many times is this loop going around? Going to have to go around? How much work is the computer going to have to do in this case? Um, and this kind of depends on the index uh, uh, of of where we're adding and removing, right? If, if we're adding or removing at the very end of our of our list, 
uh, then there's kind of no shifting over of elements that need to be done. So if kind of the, the, the amount of time that these methods take depends on uh, the index, how do we go about analyzing this? Well, uh, computer scientists when doing this kind of analysis tend to be a pessimistic bunch. They tend to think about the worst case that these methods might take. Uh, the, what, what is the, the most amount of uh, work that this method might require the system to do? Uh, and pessimistic though it may be, thinking in the worst case is actually useful uh, because uh, like one, uh, if, it's, if it's fast half the time and really slow half the time, uh, then it's, it's going to be a problem. So uh, if we think about the worst case for add and remove, that's going to be when we have to shift the entire array. And uh, that's going to occur when we add something or remove something at the very beginning of our array. If we add something at index zero, we have to take everything that's currently in the array and shift it over one spot. If we remove something uh, that's at the start again, we have to take everything currently in the array and shift it to the left one spot. And so if our, uh, uh, if our array has n elements, let's say, n is, uh, we have n elements, uh, it's going to take n uh, shifts uh, in the worst case, because um, we're going to have to shift over every element in our array. So we might ask, how many operations does each shift take? Right? If we have n shifts, how much work does that actually mean? Uh, and in this case, there's going to be uh, something like four steps involved in each shift. We're going to check the loop condition, we're going to uh, retrieve, uh, uh, we're, we're going to perform this arithmetic, uh, we're going to do this assignment, uh, and then we're going to increment our loop variable. Uh, and similar steps for both this for loop and this while loop. And so if I say it takes four operations to do each shift, well, it's always four. Four is a constant number of operations. So uh, uh, a constant number of operations for each shift. And so uh, the result of this analysis is that uh, if we have n elements, we uh, uh, take something like 4 times n uh, steps in order to complete uh, our remove operation. And so uh, we're, we call this uh, linear time in contrast to the constant time operations that we were talking about before. Uh, and we call it linear time because uh, the expression 4 times n is, a, uh, is linear in terms, in terms of n. As n gets bigger, the value of 4 times n gets bigger uh, at, a, at a rate that's linear in proportion to n. Um, and so uh, our add and remove methods here are uh, potentially uh, are, are much less efficient in terms of time than our, our get and set because they might involve a whole bunch of shifts. All right, so let's finish out is empty and size uh, real quickly and then turn our attention to what ensure capacity is going to do. So our uh, is empty, we're just going to return uh, is the size currently zero? Is the number of elements uh, in the array currently zero? Uh, this should be array. And then size, we're just going to return uh, element count, our field that's keeping track of how many elements are in the array. So these are, are nice and simple. All right, so now on to ensure capacity. So our strategy here is uh, well, our goal here is that the post condition of this 
uh, helper method is that the capacity uh, of this array uh, is at least, um, I guess, target size, rather, this is the minimum capacity that we want our array to have because if it's already bigger than min capacity, that is fine. That, yeah, we're, we're not going to complain. Uh, we have room for the operation we're currently doing. Uh, so it's really just a problem is if our array is too small, we're going to get an array out of bounds exception uh, when we try and index past the end of our array. And so we could just try and make our array slightly bigger uh, to, to match min capacity exactly um, uh, if it's like one past the end of our array. Uh, but we're going to do something slightly uh, different. So uh, in the case where our internal array um, is uh, less than min capacity, that's when we're going to need to do something. Otherwise, we've already achieved min capacity and uh, we don't need to do anything. But in the case where our, our, our data is too small, we're going to um, say that our, our new, the new length of our array uh, is uh, our kind of initial guess for how, how large our new array is going to be is its, is, its current, is its current length. And then while this new length is less than min capacity, we're going to multiply it by 2. So we're going to kind of double the size of our array until we have an array big enough to actually uh, store uh, to, to meet this minimum capacity. So we have this new length variable, and now our new element data, which will actually be an int array, is going to be uh, a new int array of new length. So we're going to create a new uh, a new array that is big enough, and then we're going to copy over our old data. So uh, for int i is zero, i less than element count i plus plus. We're going to copy over our um, old array to our new array. So this is the trick that our array and list is using to uh, ensure that, to, to provide the illusion of an array that kind of grows to be as big as you need it to be, is whenever it runs out of room, we're going to double its size. Um, and uh, by creating a new, bigger internal array and copying over the old to that one. And of course, after we copy over the old data, we then just update our field to be our new element data. Um, why doubling specifically here? Um, uh, that gives us a uh, kind of, that in practice will make this uh, ensure capacity relatively efficient um, uh, because if we double the size of our array every time we run out of space, it will it will let us average. It will make the time it takes to make these capacity increases average out to constant time uh, over uh, uh, over n elements added to our array. So uh, to to go through this uh, uh, analysis, let's suppose that. Um, uh, for kind of uh, to, to make this simple, um, n, the number of elements that we're going to add to the array, uh, n is a power of 2, and that uh, 
our initial capacity is 1. I know that I set our initial capacity to 10 in the constructor, but uh, for this analysis, it's a little simpler if we say that it, it, it's 1. So uh, we know that um, uh, when, uh, when we go from uh, capacity 1 uh, to capacity 2, um, that causes um, uh, one element uh, to be copied. And when we go from capacity, when we end up doubling again, to, from capacity 2 to capacity 4, uh, two elements are copied, right? Because we, we had two, we need to extend it to 4, so we copy those two elements to a new array of size 4. And this pattern continues that when we go from capacity 4 to capacity 8, uh, four elements are copied. Um, and this continues uh, and so on and so forth until when we our final extension is from capacity n divided by 2 to capacity n, and uh, then we're going to need n divided by 2 elements are copied. And so now we have gone through and written down all kind of the number of elements, the, the amount of work involved in all the extensions that will take place as we add n elements to our, uh, to our array list. And uh, if we add these all up, we have 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus all the way uh, up to n over 2. Uh, this will actually work out to the quantity n minus 1. Um, and so to add n elements uh, to the list are, will... Uh, result in a total of n minus 1 copies. So that's an average of approximately one copy for ele per element. Uh, and so therefore we have a constant time overhead uh, to support extending the array. Meaning that uh, to support an array with data of size n, that's an average of kind of one copy per element. So there's kind of not, so that the kind of amount of extra work that we have to do is constant in uh, constant time with respect to, to the size of, of the input. Now, this is not, this averages out to constant time, but obviously it's not, uh, uh, kind of evenly distributed because uh, for kind of most of the time that we add to our array, that addition we add to the end of our array, that addition is constant, uh, constant time. Uh, but sometimes we have to double the size of the array, and uh, uh, that takes that takes longer. So um, if we kind of use this, uh, this analysis in thinking about what is uh, the, the performance of our, our add method. Um, constant, it is constant time, but only on average, meaning that sometimes uh, it, may, it may be require copying everything currently in the array. The last thing that I want to do is to, uh, now that I have this implementation of an array int list, is to just Make sure that it still uh, it still it will compute uh, the mean successfully, and indeed we get the same mean that we did with the giant array, but uh, with a much more efficient use of space. Uh, and with that, uh, I look forward to your questions and to seeing some of you in the learning block. And my shirt has changed, movie magic. But I'm back to cover one last point uh, for today, which is. 
we have created this array int list that can store this extensible array of ints, but what if we wanted to store some other type of data? Would we need an array string list and an array double list? That seems like a, not, a, not a great solution. And in fact, Java has a feature called generics that is for exactly this purpose. And so I just wanna show you what that looks like in terms of using it. Um, uh, with uh, Java's built-in ArrayList class. So import java.util.arraylist. It's the same idea of an extensible array as the array in list that we worked on. And you use angle brackets with ArrayList to tell it what type of data are going to be stored inside the ArrayList. And this is where those kind of object versions of the primitive types um, one of the places in which they are necessary because uh, it's not, Java is not going to let us uh, specify that um, our array list stores something of a primitive type. It has to be an object. Uh, and so if we wanted to store integers, we in angle brackets give it the type of data. Uh, that it's going to store. And so this is the syntax for that. And this gives us an array list, uh, which can be, which can store an integer, but we could change this to string, to double, to any object uh, which our array is going to contain. If you're curious about what this looks like on the implementation side, how the implementation of array list might actually achieve this, uh, that's included in the, no in the notes. Um, but I just wanted to make sure uh, to go over how that's actually used.